Welcome, everybody. If you didn't know, we're in symposium number one, the applications of Middle East machine learning in biodiversity image analysis. I'm your moderator, Quentin Groom, and my co-moderator is Lizzie Elwood. We're grateful also to the tech support from Katie McWilliamson and the University of Florida conference team. I should let you know that this session will be recorded for later viewing. Uh, thank you for joining us and thank you for all the speakers in this session. Each presenter will be present for 10 minutes and there'll be three minutes of questions at the end of each presentation and two minutes to transition between presenters. Please ask questions of the speakers in the Q&A feature in uh, Hoover, if I pronounce that correctly, and uh, these will be asked by the co-moderator to the uh, presenters. The chat function is also available for technical questions or just chatting with the other attendees. Um, please use it judiciously. Any inappropriate use of the chat may be result in you being removed from the session or the chat function being disabled. Please see our code of conduct document for more information. Please bear with any technical difficulties we may have and enjoy this session. So I will go straight over to our first speaker who is Hervé Google? Yes, Google. <laughs> okay, thank you. Thank you. So I share my presentation. Okay. Is it okay like this? Yes, looks good. Yes. Okay. So hello everyone. My name is Hervé Guéo. I'm a computer scientist at CIRAD, Montpellier, France. And with my colleagues Pierre Bonnet from CIRAD and Alex Jolie from INRIA, both leaders of the PlantNet project, we wanted to share with you today a feedback on, on the potential use of herbarium collection to automatically identify plants but on field photo. So the identification of plant species is a difficult task because it requires a lot of expertise regarding the very large number of species. It's, however, a case tip for many studies in biology, essential for botanists, taxonomists, and ecologists. But thanks to artificial intelligence and the development of mobile technologies, we now have more and more identification tools that are increasingly effective and appreciated by the general public and the experts also. With my colleagues, we have for more 10 years uh, measured uh, in a more academic way the impressive progress of AI applied to plant identification by organizing an annual competition open to all practitioners of computer vision and machine learning. This is a plant clay challenge organized in the context of uh, Life Clay, the clay lab dedicated to the automated identification and prediction of biodiversity. Uh, one interesting feedback we have on the first seven years of competition is that despite the increasing difficulty of the challenge with more and more species, more images, more type of views, methods used by the participants progressed faster thanks to the arrival of deep learning. Today, we have the false impression that the identification problem is solved and that AI based plant, system, plant species identification systems are now performing well. Actually, it's not really the case and it, it's, and even less for the tropical regions. Two years ago, we organized a plant state challenge dedicated to tropical flora, and we measured performances strongly decreasing compared to the previous years. Deep learning technologies need a large number of annotated photographs to work properly, but in tropical regions, which have the greatest biodiversity, it is unfortunately also the regions that like the most data. This is due to many reasons, Plants are difficult to access far from human habitats in tree stops, and we have many species in a given genus or very small specimens, etc. Great hopes are placed on the potential use of herbarium collections. In recent years, thanks to big initiatives such as uh, Edigbio or Iricol Nat, millions of herbarium sheets are now available online. This, is re this represents a large amount of uh, visual information that can potentially be exploited by artificial intelligence and help to improve automatic identification. So since uh, last year, we have us designed a new plant clay challenge to study if it's possible to use this herbarium collection to identify field photographs despite the significant differences in visual content. At first sight, one can say it's not so difficult. A leaf remains a leaf, a fruit a fruit. But as you can see in this uh, free example, where you, you have one field photograph and one herbarium sheet from the same individual specimen each time, 
the organs are partially recognizable, but there is a great shift on between the field photo domain and the herbarium domain. And that's it's very challenging for deep learning models. So here we have the data set we have proposed to the participants over the two years of competition. So for the test set, it contains exclusively a field photo related to the tropical flora of French Guiana, shared by two world renowned uh, botanists. In the training set, we essentially provided large, a large number of um, herbarium sheets from the RBA ERD de Guyane, related to the species in the test set, of course, but extended to about 1,000 species to be more representative of the richness of the flora of Guyana. We also provided more training data by integrating herbarium sheets through EDIC Bio, and we authorized the use of external data. We have also introduced five threads at the species level from the Encyclopedia of Live, Trey Bank, and we completed this thread with experts so that each tray had at, at least one value for each species. And this tray could be used as supplementary metadata to help to learn better models. <clears throat> for the metric, we use the mean reciprocal rank. It's a less uh, strict metric than the usual top one accuracy. So it gives indirectly on average the rank of the correct species among the proposed list of species sorted by decreasing probabilities. So if a participant managed to have a MRR of 0.5, it means that on average, the correct species proposed at the second position. And an MRR of 0.2 means it's uh, the fifth proposition. And we also use a second MRR, but on the subset of the most difficult species, the one where we have the less amount of field photo in the training. So the idea here is to evaluate the genericity of, me of uh, method to to highlight methods which suffer the less from the lack of field photographs in the training set. So over the two years, we, despite the difficulty of the challenge, we managed to have seven participants who submitted various methods that are difficult to present here in such short time. So I just give here some keywords. We can note that all the participants use deep learning approaches with various strategies around transfer learning, the user data set, the choice of data augmentation, the use of external data or not, some of them have directly used convolutional neural networks, CNNs, and others have deployed more elaborated approaches addressing more explicitly the shift problem between the two domains. So here we have the result obtained the first year. We can see that first the scores are quite low with an MRR of 0.18, uh, indicating that at best the average rank of the correct species is between the five, the fifth and the sixth position among the list of the 1,000 species. But it's more obvious that the, the strong difference in performances between the CNNs and the deep adaptation, the domain adaptation approaches. Sorry. So in the next slide, I try to represent in a more intuitive way what happens between the two types of approaches by following how the winning approach is different from a classical CNN approach. So uh, for when you have a CNN, for example, a ResNet 50 here, it can be represented actually in two parts, an encoder and a, a classifier. And during the training, the encoder is trained to, to extract for each image a feature vector of size 2048 here, which facilitate, facilitates its classification by the classifier. So a good encoder will tend to group images from the same species and the same type of uh, organ in the same area of the speedier space. And we can also expect that the proximities between groups partially reflect the taxonomic proximities. Once the training is stopped, we can see how the test data is found in the feature space. And we hope that the test photo will be found close to the abayam sheets from the same species in this feature trace in order to be correctly classified by the, the classifier. And, but in this example, we can see that the photos, the test photo are rather in peripheral areas of or between the, the group of abayam sheets, which means that there was not enough information transferred between the two domains. So one domain adaptation is, can try to constrain uh, the feature space to better match the training abayam sheets and the test field photo. So the winning approach in 2020 is based on FSDI approach for few shot adversarial domain adaptation. And it introduced a supplementary neural network to the CNN, the discriminator trained in an adversarial, adversarial way to the encoder. The encoder must therefore solve two tasks at the same time, extract features useful for the species classification and fool the, the discriminator, while the discriminator, of course, is trained to be not fooled by the encoder. 
So the training is stopped when the discriminator is no longer able to predict whether the features extracted by the encoder is come from a field photograph or from an MIM sheet. With this type of approach, we can see that we have better separation of groups and the test field photo are much closer to the training MIM sheets from the same species in the feature space, enabling thus a major classification and better species predictions. Then the FSD approach can be extended in a multitask way uh, with more discriminators and classifiers working on novel levels of information such as taxonomy or traits to try to learn a better feature space. If we go back to the results, this year's result, we can see that the FSD approach outperforms the classical CNN. The multitask version of the FSD uh, with based on genus and family improves significantly the single task version. And we can so see also that the traits provide the really useful information to improve the prediction. The problem, sorry. Um, yes, also the neuron team's approach is also worth noting. Today I have, no, I have no time to explain it and I will refer you to the associated publication, but it's interesting to note that their approach is based on triplet loss and the use of metric learning between the two domains. Their method allows better generalization, as we can see with the small differences between the blue and orange bars, where the orange bars represent the score on the most difficult species. Uh, we can say that the methods suffer less from the lack of field photo in the training set. So in conclusion, the result of the experiments conducted are promising. They demonstrate the potential interest of digitized herbarium data for automated plant identification. We have so however, we have still to progress to, to make before integrating this kind of approach in production. And also we can say that uh, cross-domain adaptation can be used in other tasks, for instance, uh, phenological stage estimation. So thank you, everybody. And uh, just take a few more seconds to announce, make just an announce about the next year plant clay change, where we decide to take the story to the end and tackle the ultimate problem at global scale. Thank you. Well, perfectly giving to time. Thank you very much. We don't have any questions at the moment, but I actually had one. So if I understand correctly, for your training data set, you always need to have a live picture of live pictures of the plant and the herbarium specimen. Is that right? Yes, but the more you have the better it is, but uh you need a little, at least a little amount of photo, photo in the field. But actually you have no choice. You, we took everything what was possible to, to, to take. Uh, you don't have so much, because we're talking about difficult species more in the long tail of the biodiversity distribution, we can say. So we try to take the more photo we, we can, but actually we didn't have so much. And this is why it's a double problem. It's a problem, a problem of, uh, of domain adaptation, but it's a problem also of, of uh, rare data for the field for one domain. So it's an yeah, there is a big asymmetry between the two domains. And so, so can you estimate how much better it is having the herbarium specimen data in there, or did I miss that? Wait, how much what? How much better it is having the herbarium data in there compared to just using the pictures from. Uh, we can go back to the okay. It's very slow. <laughs> I wanted to go back to, but I don't remember the number. It's about uh, three hundred thousand herbariums for one thousand species. While we have we have only four thousand photos, if I remember well. So it, it gives you the ratio. We can you can have uh, external data was authorized, so it's difficult to have an estimation. But yes, it's, it, you will have again a strong long tail distribution. Of, so, so for some of them you will have a lot of photos, but for most of them you will have few more photos. Even with external data, you can find with uh, I don't know the GB for even with a Google search or uh, Bing web search engine. Thank you. I'll just add, um, Hervé, I know we're close on time here, um, that there was a question for you from Guido Sauter. So if you um, would like to address that in the Whova platform, oh, um, 
uh, that might be the best place for it. Thanks. Okay. Thank you. So I guess we need to move on. That's the time then. And the next person up is Krishna Kumar from the University of Ghent. Krishna, are you there? Ah, uh, yeah, I'm oh. here. Uh, I'm just sharing the screen now. Great, thank you. Mm. Yeah. Uh, hope you're able to see my screen. Yes, perfect. Oh, yeah. So uh, my name is Krishna, and I, uh, as Quentin just mentioned, I belong to a group uh, from the Kent University, and I'm I'm here and I'm here to talk about our work on species detection, uh, wherein, uh, how we can work on with multi-specimen hypoia. So uh, overall, uh, in in this work, uh, in this talk, I would be covering uh, uh, the problem statement, our approach here, and then uh, our challenges as well. So uh, the main problem uh, with uh, old, Herbaria uh, from uh, the 18th and the 19th century is that we found uh, uh, multiple specimens from different plant uh, of different variety of plants uh, in the same page. So and often uh, uh, it is not yet uh, enriched uh, or linked properly, and so uh, this has given us the challenge or the opportunity to work on uh, automatically enriching uh, the plant specimens uh, with their metadata, which is already in most cases there with the plant. So in this in this case, if you can see, so uh, uh, there are like three varieties of plants here, three different types of plants. And uh, it, there is also a small description that is written uh, about the plant, but when you search this uh, in the online herbaria, for instance, you would see the same page appearing for all the three plants that is mentioned in the plant. So, if it is properly enriched, it would be much more uh, useful for other uh, studies that can be done on the same plant. So, uh, uh, and the, appro uh, the approach that we uh, propose is that uh, first we try to pre-process the uh, images so normally uh, they are photographed so it needs some pre-processing and since they are herbaria books uh, there are like uh, uh, occlusions uh, happening because of the thickness of the book so we try to remove these based on our pre-processing pitch detection algorithm and then uh, do some uh, uh, detection based on uh, detectors and mask or CNNs like uh, so which uh, and we have compared them and so we, uh, uh, we have uh, some results on that as well. And then uh, we also did some, uh, uh, so, uh, we did a test run on how the text detection also works uh, with regards to uh, the text reduction of uh, recognition algorithms there. So um, uh, uh, to uh, the long story short, so the pre-processing algorithm works in such a way that we first straighten uh, the, uh, the, the, the book as such, and then extract the book using uh, color clustering. And then uh, based on uh, the, based on the, uh, based on detecting the fourth edge of it, we are able to perform morphological corrections on it so that uh, the page is a lot more straightened. Uh, why this is more important was uh, uh, do, uh, the text in the edges of the, uh, the page were not uh, so well detected if it was like occluded a bit. So this uh, was much more uh, helpful in uh, detecting the text boxes in the edge, for instance, these text boxes like in the edge of it. Um, oh, sorry. Uh, the next part would be the, uh, uh, the recognition of plants in itself. So there were two, uh, two main uh, varieties wherein one would be just localizing or detecting the plants and the next part uh, or, or, uh, or the other one would be segmentation. So we, uh, we were not sure which one to work with uh, because labeling with segmentations, we felt it would take a really long time. So we initially started off with labeling with just bounding boxes, which is much more easier. So to, uh, to do a test, uh, we labeled 70, uh, 70 uh, sheets with plants like these. Uh, 
and we tried to uh, run YOLO on it. Uh, what we found out what it is, even though it was trying to learn uh, where the text boxes were, still uh, detecting the plants correctly and localizing them uh, was a hard task for it. So uh, we need to have more data uh, so that uh, it, it was still able to detect plants with, uh, which were overlapping. So for that, we try to improve the more uh, improve the amount of data with um, a single a single species herbarium sheets. Uh, we try to extract uh, the plants uh, from them, and then we try to uh, synthetically uh, train the samples based on uh, a mosaic based algorithm, so that uh, we were able to we will be able to detect multiple plants, and the learning would also be faster in that case. So for that, we tried to uh, use the CAG, uh, Kaggle dataset uh, of Herbaria, um, uh, which had like hundred k images, uh, and uh, the results uh, were uh, we we felt that it was still mo uh, moving towards learning uh, better. But we, it, uh, we were still not uh, sure that it was working as what we expected. So uh, from, uh, from our uh, segmentation, uh, from our segmentation example, we used the same thing and uh, we tried to uh, detect segmented masks. And uh, what we did was uh, to manually label uh, 2,500 sheets like, uh, to say whether the segmented uh, masks would were good or bad. So we just selected the good uh, ones and we tried to run a mask or CNN on top of it. So uh, what we try, uh, what we felt was uh, the segmented model was learning much more uh, faster, and it was also uh, uh, it was also able to uh, localize uh, much more uh, in a much more efficient way. However, uh, we also feel that uh, uh, if there are uh, picture, uh, if there are if the plants are like close enough, uh, it still has some problems. So we are trying. Uh, we are currently working on um, uh, improving the Moscow CNN by using um, copy paste augmentation and things like that. So which is currently our uh, scope of work. So when you see a comparison between the detection and the prediction uh, the uh, the segmentation already works much better in a much a much smaller training time um, we also did some feasibility for the text recognition uh, and what we felt was uh, uh, for uh, for much more newer examples um, uh, it had more printed text which was uh, uh, which were detected with much more uh, accurate uh, accuracy um, However, uh, uh, there were also um, uh, sheets which had handwritten text, uh, and that uh, still uh, and uh, those things it was still not possible uh, to have it, you know, uh, with a very good accurate uh, results. Uh, however, uh, it also uh, it was also uh, good to note that if uh, the uh, if the text recognition uh, if the if the image was much more uh, was a much higher resolution for instance it was still able to find uh, much more uh, uh, important terminologies that are that might correspond to the plants that we are looking for for uh, for instance in this example uh, dahlia pinne was the plant name if i'm not wrong uh, and that was uh, the plant that we are actually trying to label. So if we do some smart clustering, we felt we would be able to, um, uh, we would be able to detect the plants from the description itself. Um, uh, so to conclude what we have been uh, currently working on, uh, our initial test seems promising, but uh, uh, the data set variability uh, is still an issue. So we have to uh, synthetically create new data sets or uh, augmentations uh, so that it improves the results at the moment. Uh, we are also um, uh, focusing on other metadata that is as uh, that is spread around like for instance there is like the uh, color bar and the scale for instance uh, which might also add more uh, information to what uh, the plant is there um, so that's something that i wanted to discuss today thank you
if you have questions uh thank you krishna that's very nice mm. Just at questions we don't have anything in the chat at the mm -hmm. moment i think those questions were for survey i was wondering given our herbarium has something like three million herbarium specimens the in images now. What mm -hmm. are the low hanging fruits for us? I mean, if we were just going to use one, what what machine learning algorithm worked really well, and we can get some useful information out of by running all of them through it, or isn't there such a thing at the moment? Uh, can you can you repeat the question because I lost you at the moment in the middle? Well, it's, it's not, some some algorithms are, are, are really in the infancy in terms of how successful they work, but. I suspect some are much more advanced than others. Is there any information that's really easy to get out of a herbarium specimen? Uh, yeah. So uh, again, uh, the complexity of the herbarium there uh, is more uh, of the question. So let's say if it is just a single uh, uh, herbarium sheet with, uh, you know, uh, there, if there is just one plant in the herbarium and then there is just some information that is written about the plant, even if it is... Uh, a few words or though so uh, uh, with regards to text uh, it is still uh, in infancy i would say but uh, in detection and segmentation of these i think uh, it is already uh, in a much developed state um, the problem arises when there are like uh, three four overlapping uh, 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 plant species that are there um, and uh, i think there is uh, is what the problem arises Thanks, Krishna. There are now a couple of questions in the Whova platform. Maybe you can see them too. Um, the oh. first from Steve Baskoff says, what would you estimate the accuracy is on printed labels using Keras OCR? Mm -mm. Sorry, can you repeat it again? Mm -hmm. What would you estimate the accuracy is on printed labels using Keras, K-E-R-A-S, OCR? Uh, yeah, yeah, yeah. So uh, uh, at the moment, so what we are trying to do is like, uh, we, we already have a small uh, validation set on which uh, each one of uh, these, uh, uh, we have some information on what it is actually written. So we are trying to validate our uh, the key, uh, the OCR results on top of uh, the validation set there. Thank you. And oh, yeah. um, a second question now from, where did that one go? I thought it was here. Oh, from Eve Lucas. For the group mm -hmm. I work on, I need to see characters from the inside of the flower for identification. What is the mm -hmm. path to get to the point where traits not visible to the naked eye can be processed automatically? Ooh, that's a tricky one. <laughs> uh, okay. So, uh... Uh, we were also uh, thinking of the same kind of a problem. So that is why what we tried to do was to uh, label some uh, text boxes in some uh, these kind of herbaria. Uh, and what we try, uh, what we witnessed was like uh, if the herb uh, if the quality of the herbarium scan was really good, uh, it was still able to pick uh, these kind of text boxes much more uh, accurately than the uh, you know uh, the plant in itself. So I think if they can uh, train a model or if they can uh, label uh, some text boxes and train them on top of it, I think it should be able to get something out of that. And do you think the same would be true for the, the treats on the flower as well? So if a petal is obscuring some of the internal um, reproductive structures, for example. Ah, yeah, uh, those, uh, I think it might work better if, if you have like a mask out of it. So uh, if you wanted to have the structural information of the, uh, the flower or so, I think then you have to go more towards uh, segmentation kind of stuff. Thank you so much. Um, mm -hmm. And those questions are in Whova if there was anything that you wanted to follow up with. Definitely, I, I would, I would try to answer them there. Okay. Thank you. Yes. Thank you, Krishna. Now we're moving on to Jonathan Koss. You can introduce yourself. Yes. Um, hi everyone, um, I'm Jonathan Koss. Um, I'm going to be talking actually a little bit about what Quentin kindly um, brought up. 
um, which is sort of this issue of um, once we have these machine learning techniques um, for labeling these data sets of herbarium sheets, and we've done some work, you know, showing the accuracies and um, also from these, these competitions as discussed in the first presentation, um, how can we actually take these machine learning algorithms and use them on a new untrained data set to come up with labels that we're confident enough in um, that can, so that they can actually be you know, considered the, the truth as if they were hand labeled and used in further research. Um, so the problem we focused on was one that was brought up in the first talk as well, where we have these herbarium samples and we're trying to classify the phenology. Um, and um, there have been some, there's one machine learning based competition for this type of labeling using herbarium sheets for these four categories of reproductive state. Um, and there had been a, a number of papers that came out um, that got pretty good results um, using deep learning to classify these. So we thought this would be a good place to start. Um, and the collection I work with at the BLP Body Museum has hundreds of thousands of unlabeled herbarium sheets that require this kind of classification and are currently being done manually. Um, so we wanted to try to find a way to, to use deep learning to speed this up, as people have shown might be possible. Um, so we use this um, data set of New England vascular plants from around here. Um, and they had already been labeled by hand by uh, uh, people trained to label the reproductive state of these herbarium sheets. Um, we had about 50,000 images in total, uh, which we split into training and, and test sets as needed. Um, and what we did was based on um, a this exception network, which had been shown um, by the, the first group presenting to perform well um, at this, this task of labeling the reproductive state. Um, and we trained four of these networks, um, one for each question that we had to answer. Um, whether it was reproductive or not, whether it was budding or not, and so on. Um, and so each network produced a kind of binary output of yes or no on these. Um, and our, our test accuracies that we got with this um, were sort of in line with what other people had gotten um, when applying deep learning to this task. Um, but as you can see here, they're around 80 to, to 90% roughly. Um, so even though this is good and very impressive, it wasn't quite high enough that the, the people I was working with were confident that these labels at this accuracy could then be used for further research. Um, and people, I think, tend to feel more confident about hand-labeled things in general, so that makes sense. Um, so sort of what I started working on was how can we actually take this um, and take a unlabeled data set that people haven't looked before of these herbarium sheets and actually use a deep learning system um, to, to label them. And since people were already using these sort of cutting edge deep learning techniques and getting these accuracies, I felt that trying to just improve this overall accuracy was, was daunting and there were already other people working on it. Um, and there wasn't much I could do there. Um, but what I decided to do was if instead of trying to label every single herbarium sheet, um, I hope that if we were able to come up with some sort of confidence metric of our own labels, we could then label the herbarium sheets for these reproductive state categories um, for the ones we're confident in. And for the, the herbarium sheets where uh, the neural network isn't confident in the labels. Um, those could just be set aside and labeled manually as needed. Um, and then at least that'll reduce the total number of, of labeling that needs to be done since it is very time consuming to go through tens of thousands of these sheets. Um, so the first question I had to answer here was sort of, what is a, a confidence, what's a good confidence metric? And to me, the way I thought about it was a, a good confidence metric is one where if we're 95% confident, according to our metric, 
about 95% of things labeled at that confidence should be correct. Um, and finding this um, was actually surprisingly easy since we were able to just use the value um, that this network outputs from this final logistic regression layer. So this network outputs a value between zero and one. Um, and typically how it's used is if it's below 0.5, that labels it as, as the negative value, say not budding. But if it's above 0.5, um, that can be labeled as budding. Um, but what we were able to do instead, or what we found was true in this case, and there have been, this isn't proven to be true, and this isn't exactly what this network is doing, but it did work for our purposes, where we were able to take this output value and this output value between zero and one um, was linearly mapped to a, a value we could use as a confidence metric. So we could only take the outputs that were either very close to one or very close to zero and use those as the, the confident labels while everything that fell in between, we considered a, um, not possible to label confidently with this network. Um, and so we did two tests on this um that were inspired by um one of the problems that people run into which is you have you trained your your deep learning network on some some already labeled set but then if you want to go and apply it to another unlabeled set you always run the risk that the your your network performs well within the sample space that the existing samples come from but this new you know data set might not be exactly the same as the old one um, so we first tested it on one that was rough, roughly the same as what we had trained it on. There were the same um, types of plants as found, the same families of plants as found in the, in the data set our network was trained on. Um, but these were never before labeled herbarium sheets. And we sort of did a, a blinded test where we had the neural network label them. Um, and also one of our collaborators who's a, an expert in this label, the reproductive states. Um, and we found that it, um, depending on the category, it labeled about 85 to 50% of these 100 sheets. Um, but what, what made me happy with this was that, um, as you can see here, we had almost no false positives or false negatives in, our, in the ones that were labeled um, at high confidence. Um, so this kind of reassured me that at least within a similar data set, we'd be able to um, apply this network to it to label things and achieve a high enough accuracy that we can we can trust these labels for further research. Um, and for the the next test I wanted to do um, was it was a property that I really wanted our, our final model to have here, which is, can you just, if it has a way of knowing whether it's confident or not, I was hoping that you could just throw in whatever you want into the network and it'll just label label the ones it's able to label confidently. And if it can't label things confidently, it just won't label them. So we selected from a, a broad range of um, plant families, um, including ones that were the, some of these reproductive states, whether it's fruiting in particular, can't be determined by looking at it. And again, we had our, our collaborator who's an expert in labeling these label them and we had the network label them. Um, and again, here it's it's unsurprising that the, um, the total number labeled was so small because um, for many, for more than half of these, it was just simply not possible to label whether or not they were budding or fruiting say from the the picture itself. Um, a lot of those plants were things like ferns, which I guess don't have visible um, fruits that can be seen on the herbarium sheet. Um, but it was reassuring to me to see that when we we gave the network things that it shouldn't be able to label, it wasn't confident in those labels, but it was confident in labeling a small subset of those, which were ones that we did expect it to label. Um, and I guess from here where we want to go is we want to test this a little further on a, a larger sample. And then if we achieve about the same performance, we could actually go ahead and 
run tens if not hundreds of thousands of unlabeled herbarium sheets through this and get these kinds of labels out that could be used um, for further research. Um, that's all I have, um, but I'm happy to answer any questions about this. Thank you. That's great, thank you. We do have a couple of questions here on okay, Hoover. And first I'll just mention this one from Patricia Mergen, which is from the last speaker, but um, uh, I wanted to put it out there in case anybody wanted to answer it. And that is for handwritten labels, would you recommend crowdsourcing or machine learning? I know yours didn't um, necessarily go into that as much, Jonathan, but um, wanted to put that out there. Um, did, did you want to comment on that or do you want to jump into the next ones? I'd, I'd rather not comment yeah, on that. Yeah, no problem. So then um, the um, next one from Lauren Gillespie here. What were the threshold values you used to classify samples as negative or positive? Also, did you use any calibration techniques before thresholding the probabilities as confident or not confident? Um, so the, the thresholds themselves varied between the four networks for each category, um, but ended up being around, I'd say like 0 0.8 to 0.95 or 0.05 to point two. Um, and we actually didn't need to use any calibration um, ahead of time. Um, but that was also surprising to me because I ex expected we would have to do something a little fancier than this. <laughs> so good question. <laughs> <laughs> Thanks. Or, thank you for answering. <laughs> um, and how, this is from Yorit. Uh, how can I access the image corpus you worked with? Hmm. That is a question that I can get back to him about. Um, okay. I'm not a botanist or someone who deals with these things, and that was not my part of the work. But I think it is on one of those one of these plant larger plant databases that is accessible, and that is the past presenters have also used. <laughs> Sure. Yeah. So again, this is on Whova. So if, if there are specifics you want yeah, to point them to, feel free to respond there. I can do that. Thanks. Um, so that's all that's in the q and I believe, so far for you, Jonathan. Thank you so much. Um, sure. While we have another minute, if anybody wanted to answer the um, some of the past questions that I think, um, given the fact that um, uh, so many of our speakers are working on related um, kind of techniques. There's um, uh, a question here from Nikki Nicholson. Is there any research on using field photos extracted from literature, which would perhaps link the type material with the field observation in the case of publications of new species? I'm not necessarily putting you alone on the spot here for that one, Jonathan, but um, uh, if any of our, our speakers wanted to um, address that or put another question for Jonathan in the Q&A box. I am really not sure about that either. So if anyone <laughs> wants to jump in, please do. No problem. Oh, we'll have time for discussion, I think at the end, so we don't need to um, um, push it at the moment either. I have kind of a question. It's a question for everyone actually, but when you say you, you now want to use it on hundreds of thousands of images, how are you going to get all of those hundred thousands of images together in one place to be actually be able to process? Um, I, I guess they've already um, the ones at this. I guess consortium of museums have already digitized that many that are are not labeled in terms of phenology. Um, but yes, that is also. Uh, I, I think it's a, a non-trivial problem to actually, to, to, you know, all the bandwidth you need, the server size you need, and then all the processing power you need. And, and you could imagine this being scaled up ultimately globally so that you were looking at literally millions of images, but then you have the problem of how on earth you, do you process them. Um, so I think that's one of the next challenges we have with this. Yeah, I mean, a, a small perk of deep learning is that you kind of 
what you you pay for in, in the long training times you actually gain in a very quick um, processing time. So the time once you have a trained model, the time it actually takes to run through these images is very low, and it actually ends up just being sort of like a storage problem. That's a, sounds a tiny bit related to the question um, on Hoover from Barnaby Walker. So maybe Jonathan, if you have a sec to check that out too, he asks about cost to your threshold. So um, I'll, yes, let you answer, I'll, I'll let you answer it there. Get over there. Thank you. Thank you. So Libby, is it time to move on now? Yeah, let's do that. Okay. So the next speaker is Yasin Bakis. That's nice I can see you there. You can introduce yourself. I'm here. Thank you, Quentin. Hi, everyone. I am Yasin Bakish. I will mention about the challenges in the creating multimedia uh, data and like how to gather those data, how to fix the data. Uh, just the Quentin trying to, was trying to ask about this. And uh, we got a project uh, from NSF uh, funded project and it is about BGNN uh, biology guided neural networks. Basically what we are doing is we are uh, gathering, uh, feeding the uh, fish images to the neural network and we are uh, trying to make it uh, guesses which species is that. So uh, our uh, data is coming from two main uh, image repositories and we are working on fish only and uh, all the fish images from IDIC Bio and Great Lakes Invasive Network project. So we gathered, uh, we searched the IDIC Bio and we gathered more than 500,000 uh, multimedia files. And those are belong to, some of them are non-fish images and this data is coming from everywhere. On the other hand, uh, Great Lake Invasive uh, Network images are coming from uh, five in institutions out of uh, six, and they are all fish images, and those are all 2D images that are usable, and like uh, approximately 67,000 images. This is what our workflow looks like. So we have two image repositories, Clean and IDIC Bio. And this is our, the green box is our filtering uh, pipeline. And that the larger green box with the uh, two lane logo is uh, everything includes included in two lane pipeline. And the yellow box, yellow rec rectangle is for uh, biology guided neural network project. So uh, the other, uh, items are coming from outside. So we got the data from outside, we processed it and we produced uh, CSV files, uh, we produced metadata files and we feed uh, the neural network and uh, other uh, automated metadata capturing team with those CSV files. And they gave us some feedbacks, we fixed the data uh, we update the data and we produce uh, those uh, metadata files again. This is how it works. Basically, I will try to explain uh, the details. So IDIC Bio includes web search and API plus bash. Uh, we search for all the fish families, all the fish genera and uh, fish classes. And we got more than 500,000 images. And uh, with the Glean, we got uh, 6,900, uh, 69,000 images. And then we filtered, we had to filter ID bio images because there were a lot of uh, non fish images in there, uh, just because of the search criteria. And we had to duplicate the, uh, remove the duplicates and, uh, filter the CT scans, fossil images, uh, and, uh, partial fishes and drawings and etc. So we ended up with 45,000 images at the end. And from the Glean dataset, uh, we just uh, removed the corrupted files and 
uh, there were uh, some museums included some non fish images so we removed those and then <clears throat> we used an image quality metadata web form we gathered all those uh, features from the fish images this is how our fish specimens look like they usually have a, a, a description tag on them and also a scale bar and we asked all those 22 questions and according to those we created a, a image quality metadata uh, data set and this is what our uh, image quality metadata uh, web form looks like in the uh, infrastructure type and uh, we have on the web server we have a, a web application that our contractor are signing in and like checking all those data and we are uh, keeping those in the in a postgres sql database and <clears throat> this is how our csv files look like they are like uh, flat files and uh, our neural network people ask for family names genus names species names uh, in the file and also the file name and where we can find it and we had to keep a version of the data set and also like the sub version uh, for the uh, subset of data so we are creating those files for the image list and another file for image quality metadata and after uh, we filtered the uh images the list of the images uh we ended up with 45 or 65,000 images from the id bio and most of them were uh, not fished images so we used uh image metadata coming from id bio to filter those and there were some other image types they were still fish but they were ct scans or drawings or other types of images so we eliminated those images too in the great lake invasive networks uh, everything was clear except like some uh, non-fish and uh, corrupted files and this is the usable uh, far, part of the data set and from the id bio we came across those types of uh, images that we, that are still fish but not very useful so almost half of the data set was uh, useful in our case and those are the types of images that we didn't prefer to use and we eliminated all those uh, images from our data set they can be either drawings or like fish in a different uh, photograph or uh, like including other objects or uh, CT scans, radiograph images, or curved fish, those kind of fishes that we didn't want to use. In this study, we are working on. And image uh, file size uh, graph shows. Uh, this is randomly generated ID bio images. Uh, approximately 5,000 uh, images are there here and there were two uh, accumulation was around less than one megabyte and three to four megabytes and the image resolutions are if they are like uh, small size images they are showing that kind of distribution uh, however when the file size uh, are larger or the resolution is larger then they make a curve like this because uh, they are trying to uh, keep the file size uh, low so those are very high resolution images that are uh, is for that and the great lake invasive network images uh, museums uh, have averages of those they are usually the same kind of uh, images all of them uh, among within the uh, same museum so uh, our people, neural network people, enjoyed the uh, enjoyed working with INHS museum images the most, and average size of the uh, images are around eight megabytes, 
and 4,000 to 6,000 uh, dimensions. And others are slightly lower, but they are still usable. And taxonomic diversity was another challenge. Uh, some of the, uh, most of the uh, species were represented only by one or two images. And this is like more than half of the data set. And species counts are like in this table. So our people prefer to use more than 20 images per species. And our numbers are like this. We gathered more than 100,000 images, fish images from ID Bio and those five museums. And uh, 47,000 images uh, representing uh, 555 fish specimens. Uh, we are captured. And uh, this is the uh, publications if you want to uh, take a screenshot, uh, yeah. if you're interested or in or any kind. Uh, of trick, mm. So thank you. Yeah. Hey, thank mm -hmm. you, Yasin. I'm the key those things. You can hear somebody else's voice. That needs to be muted. Good. Okay. We have a question in Hula, which I can relate to you. Yes, and it's from Katja Saltman. And she asks, is there additional metadata we as image providers could include with our images that would facilitate filtering? So from the ID bio, uh, we have uh, eliminated all those by using either IDIG bio or our uh, uh, people manually, but we have generated this form also to gather the image quality metadata. IDIG bio has a partial metadata, image quality uh, metadata information in their uh, multimedia file but you need to go through them. For example, uh, how did I uh, remove the radiograph images? I just figured out like there are some data sources. Uh, they are putting that information within the uh, uh, file name or within the URL. So I, need, I had to uh, write some scripts to like extract those information from the data set and apply the filter. Otherwise you can use uh, like botanical specimen kind of things or museum abbreviations. You can go through all the museum abbreviations and like uh, just filter out the uh, botanical ones or uh, the mollusk ones, those kind of things. So those will work. So it sounds like your filtering was pretty robust to um, be able to, or was robust enough to figure out the different types of images where you were able to kind of sleuth out some of the, the keys there that enabled you to get the images you wanted. Is there yeah. a way to maybe make it more efficient by the image providers themselves giving you more information that can help sort the images um, kind of from the start? Yeah, this is on the left ID bio after removing duplicates, this whole pie and uh, non-fish were like 75 percent so that portion that we had to remove uh, by using id bio uh, image uh, image quality or uh, multimedia metadata so that's a very large portion and after that we still had to remove but everything remaining was fish still so it comes with id bio search even uh, I searched for only fish taxa. It came with a lot of uh, non-fish specimens, like botanical specimens, mollusk specimens, because like those uh, search terms appears everywhere, and apparently it is like uh, it is it is searching uh, the those genera names, especially, are shared among all over the uh, kingdoms. Of course. Yeah, that's a, a bigger issue then. <laughs> yeah. 
Well, thank you very much. I think that's it for time. Mm -hmm. Great. And our next speaker, Lauren, are you ready? Lauren Gillespie. Uh, yes. All right. Let me start sharing my screen. Can you all see that? Yeah, thanks so much, Lauren. I'll let you take it away. Great. Uh, thank you. So as you said, my name is Lauren Gillespie, and I'm a third year computer science PhD student at Stanford University in Carnegie Science. And today I'll be talking about how we can improve plant biodiversity prediction using deep neural networks. So as you all probably know, worldwide plant and other species uh, biodiversity is at extreme risk from a warming planet to deforestation and other human based land use changes to more intense fire patterns like we have here in California and more severe weather events globally, plant biodiversity is under peril. How to quantify this biodiversity loss is critical to developing conservation techniques to stop this devastating loss. Uh, but in order for us to deeply understand what's going on in a community based and microhabitat level, in order to, to develop these con targeted conservation strategies, we need more and better high resolution community wide plant species biodiversity maps like this 300 meter resolution map of where the species most at risk to extinction on the IUCN red list are distributed in the US. However, accurately mapping biodiversity at high resolution across ecosystems has been a historically difficult task. One major hurdle to accurate biodiversity modeling is the power law relationship between the abundance of different types of species in an environment uh, with few species being relatively abundant while many more species are rare. This commonness of rarity um, confounded with the differential detectability of species can lead to misestimations of where species live, commonly known as relation shortfall. Um, to overcome these confounding factors, uh, many biodiversity maps oftentimes employ what are called models or SDMs for short. Uh, which essentially model how the distribution of a species across a landscape varies in response to a set of ecologically meaningful variables. Um, SDMs are often used to predict the full extent of where a species lives using observations of where a species has been found and then correlating those, um, those observations with environmental variables, including climate data, such as average rainfall or amount of sun exposure, uh, soil composition or elevation like you can see there at the bottom. So two very common species distribution modeling approaches are maximum entropy methods, which you can see on the left, and uh, random forest models, which you can see on the right. Uh, maximum entropy methods attempt to model a, spe a single species distribution by maximizing the likelihood of the species occurring at a, at a set of given locations where they have been observed, which are the green points on that map, while jointly minimizing the likelihood of not observing the species at the given pseudo absence points, which are those brown points on the map. Um, and so this resulting map then describes the likelihood of finding a Joshua tree across the extent of its range in Southern California. So the other common approach on the right is the random forest model. Um, and you can see an example prediction for random forest across California as well. So random forest models essentially create a series or quote unquote forest of decision trees from subsets of data, which um, then vote on the most likely set of species at a given geographic point based on the ecological variables of that location. Um, however, these very popular SDMs do have some major drawbacks. Uh, the first uh, for Maxent specifically is that it relies on pseudo absence data. Um, so if you remember, you need a list of, of both presence and absences of a species in order to build a Maxent species distribution model. However, where a species has not occurred though is a bit of a tricky phenomenological question. Um, so it's pretty clear to see where a species is present. You simply go out in the field and observe um, where you find the species, but where a species does not occur is a little bit more of a tricky question. Um, therefore, many SDMs, including Maxent, rely on negative sampling techniques or pseudo absence to, to basically how those brown points were generated. Um, but those, of course, have um, are, can be sensitive to hyperparameter choice, potentially bias prone as well. And ideally, we would like to be able to build models that do not rely on these potentially uh, brittle techniques for drawing pseudo absence points. The second big drawback is that for the vast majority of SDMs, they are fit uh, using environmental rasters like BioClim, which you see here. Um, and these rasters oftentimes have a resolution ceiling of around 300 meters per pixel. Um, and it's really kind of infeasible to build higher resolution environmental variables because how one could distinguish different environmental conditions like mean average precipitation at a meter level resolution is kind of um, impossible. However, there have been big breakthroughs recently in using remote sensing products to predict various biogeographical artifacts, such as this work here that predicts the location of, invas of invasive plant communities in Chile from unmanned aerial drone footage using a, un uh, using a UNET convolutional neural network architecture for image segmentation. Uh, so this is where our approach Deep Biosphere comes in. So we take around 100,000 plant observations from across the state of California. We pair them with high resolution RGB infrared satellite imagery data 
uh, with the goal of predicting plant community composition at 250 meter resolution across California from presence only data. So specifically, we've been working with the GeoLife uh, Geo data dataset, which pairs around 100,000 plant species observations from across California with a high resolution sat uh, satellite imagery from the NAIP uh, aerial imagery program. We also use standard bioclimatic bioclim environmental variables. And then we split the, the data set into a train and test set as well. So just as a brief overview of our deep learning architecture, um, we use a brand new architecture called the Tresnet. Um, it is devi was designed specifically for multi-label image recognition, um, where instead of predicting one, just one class at a time, like is it a dog or is it a cat, you can predict multiple classes at the same time, like is, it, is there a dog and a cat in this picture, um, which is what we're doing. We're trying to predict multiple plant species at the same time. Uh, and this architecture was also designed with a novel loss function called asymmetric focal loss, which you can see in the bottom uh, right corner, um, which is a new uh, a novel loss also designed for multi-label image recognition tasks, um, which downweights the loss from negative classes without ignoring them completely to deal with that, um, that really uh, distributed tail um, that we talked about earlier in the session. Uh, we also looked at a joint version of this model where we we're predicting not just from satellite imagery alone, but also from bioclim environmental variables as well in a, in a jointly trained fashion. Um, and the two baselines we compare against are a simple multi-response joints random forest model um, fitted with the same bioclimatic environmental variables as I discussed earlier. Uh, this model also predicts both family, genus, and species as does the uh, CNN model. And finally, our other baseline is max int. And we essentially the way we, we do this is we run max int for each individual species, and then we aggregate the probabilities at each location across, um, across the um, observations. So the CNN model shines when we look at the receiver operator characteristic curve compared to the, um, the two baselines. Um, uh, the ROC essentially evaluates the model's ability to discriminate well at different thresholds of probability of occurrence. And we can see that both the satellite only seen and then the joint seen and model have a higher AUC than either baseline, which makes it a better binary classifier than the baselines for predicting the presence of these species across a variety of thresholds. So now that we have the CNN model, we can start to predict where species are present from a list of these nearly 2,500 species that we have, um, that we predict for uh, using just satellite imagery and use it to build a comprehensive map of species biodiversity across California. So if we plot uh, the predicted alpha diversity or the number of species expected to be present at a given location from our TRESNAP model across California, which you can see on the right, um, what you can uh, yeah, what, um, what you can see though is that the maps uh, the map itself is a little less clear. Comparing our model's predictions to an empirical estimate of plant biodiversity from occurrence data, which you can see on the left, um, there's no particularly salient biodiversity trends that are apparent just from this very coarse resolution map. However, again, it's important to note that there is a large scale difference between the two. So on the on the left, the uh, empirical estimate is five kilometers box, um, and on the right, we're predicting at 250 meters per pixel, and so it is a little bit difficult to compare um, the expected biodiversity at such large scale differences. Um, and also another important point to note is that um, the, the, the strength of the CNN model is the, the high resolution. And so looking at a very low resolution in the entire state is maybe not, the, not going to um, highlight the, the strength of this model. Um, and so actually, if we do zoom in at higher resolutions, we can start to begin to use this model for biodiversity detection that neither empirical estimates nor traditional bioclim SDMs can do. So for example, we can adapt the CNN model to detect ecosystem changes or ecotones as you might have heard as well. So the Bay Area is well known for its microclimates and abrupt ecosystem transitions. And so if we zoom in on Marin County, we can see that there's a very, very, very varied landscape that emerges. Um, in order for us to detect this ecosystem change, essentially what we do is we convolve our model across the image and measure how similar the predict predicted species are in order to generate the map on the right. And so essentially what you're seeing is the brightness of the color corresponds to how rapidly what species are predicted is changing in a given area. So a brighter color essentially indicates a more rapid species turnover. Uh, indeed, the model's predictions are well capturing the rapid ecological change in this landscape, including the coast, as you can see, and the mixed forest grassland transition zone in the middle of the image. Um, furthermore, we can use the CNN model to detect not just biodiversity, but also the presence of individual species as well, both directly observable and un unobservable. For example, here on the right, you can see a map of the predicted presence of redwoods in one of the last remaining old growth redwood groves in California. So if we compare the satellite image on the left with the predictions on the right, the, we, can see that the, oh, we can see that the model does predict a higher likelihood of presence in the more forested, darker valleys from the lighter clear cut open zones. 
Um, we can then also validate our model's predictions against ground truth human annotations. And we can see that the human annotations on the, of the redwoods on the left closely align with the model's predictions on the right. Uh, the model's predictions also well correlate with the human's observations of around a Pearson's R of 0.6. Um, there are, of course, some areas that the model captures that the, um, that the observer doesn't, and those are secondary growth areas um, where the, the canopy height isn't as high. But even more amazingly, though, is that we can actually see that our model is detecting not just species directly observable from satellite imagery, like a redwood, um, but we can also see that the model is learning associations between observable uh, keystone species like redwoods and small, unobservable, but important plants like the redwood violet, which you can see on the right. Um, furthermore, the network was able to do so with only 60 observations out of over 100,000 data sets. I should also mention that there were no redwood nor redwood violet observations in either in, in this satellite imagery data. So it's not just um, it's not just uh, learning um, to, to repeat the data it's seen. Another great aspect is that this model's predictive power does translate across ecosystems as well. So for example, if we look at how well the model predicts, we can look at how well the model predicts Joshua trees in the Great Basin deserts of Southeast California. And what you can see is similar results uh, carry for vastly different biomes. Uh, as you can see, the network correctly predicts the presence of Joshua trees. So there's this white X, um, that, was a, that was a location for a Joshua tree not from our data set, this is from an outside validation set. And so we can see that the model has a higher predictive presence for where we do have a known occurrence of a Joshua tree. And the same is true also for another unobservable from satellite imagery species, the purple sage, which you can see on the right. Again, we have very few training observations for this model. So this shows that it's able to bootstrap from um, commonly co-occurring species to learn these uh, species co-occurrence interactions. Finally, we can also use this model to detect not just spatial, but also temporal biodiversity changes as well, which traditional SDMs cannot do. So specifically, we look at the Rim Fire from Yosemite, which was one of the largest fires in California's history. If we compare how the landscape changed before and after the fire, we can see that in many places there was severe burning of the entire forest canopy. Um, now, if we look at the actual predicted biodiversity from this model um, before and after the fire, we can start to see some interesting trends emerge. And indeed, we can see that the biodiversity overall has decreased significantly after the fire. Um, and this lines up with known fire ecology that indeed um, intense fire um, burning um, can, can kill off large swaths of the forest, which is not great. So in total, this work, the biosphere presents a new way to monitor plant communities from remote sensing that is automated and that it doesn't require any direct field collection or hand curation. It's community driven through the use of publicly available data and it's high resolution, provide, potentially even providing meter level resolution with ultra high res satellite imagery data that's coming out soon. Uh, and ultimately I hope this method will help to contribute to a data driven future of global change ecology and help, will help us build a high resolution comprehensive biodiversity map of the globe. And with that, I'm looking forward to y'all's questions. Fantastic. Thanks, Sorry. Lauren. We do have a minute. I don't see any questions yet. Sorry, Quentin. Are you gonna... Well, I, I have a general question. I mean, so it, it's one of the reasons you use plants is because they're kind of more stable and you haven't got to deal with the sort of dynamics or would this deal with sort of some of the dynamics you get in like uh, uh, invertebrates? Yeah, yeah. The, the main reason is because um, you can detect many um, large plant species from satellite imagery data, but also the biggest is because they can't move. Um, and oftentimes the, um, the local topography uh, dictates um, uh, where the plant can and cannot uh, live versus with um, invertebrates, it's more um, uh, variables that you can't maybe directly detect from satellite imagery, like you know streams and other things as well. But yeah, I'd be curious to see how well it does on something like invertebrates or um, uh, amphibians. Yeah, and they don't move quite as fast either, so. Mm -hmm. Maybe just a, a quick one here, Lauren. Uh, can you predict invasive species dynamics? Olivier asks in the chat. Uh, that's a great question. We have not looked into that. Um, but definitely that would be something to, to, to try next with this model. Uh, I do believe that invasive species are on the list of species uh, that we do predict because they're in the iNaturalist data set. Um, but as for the temporal movement of invasive, that's a good question. Um, and I guess it depends on what's the main driver of a invasive's ability to live in a new climate. Um, and um, I guess would be bioclimatic variables would probably predict that pretty well as well. Um, because invasives are usually pretty good at adapting to, to new climates pretty readily, but it would be interesting to see. 
Thanks, Lauren. That's it for time there. On to our next speaker. Amiros, are you there? We don't have your audio yet. Still not. <laughs> Oh, can you hear me? Yeah, we got you now. Can you hear us? Actually, try again. I'm not sure if we still have you. Can you try saying something? We were able to hear you when you had your headphones on. I guess that's. Yeah, that may be best for now. All right, whenever you're ready. Yes, I am trying to share my screen. Awesome. Great, I guess you can see it at least. Um, so, yeah, hi all. Um, I'm Omiros, and uh, I'm a PhD candidate at UCL on my second year of my PhD and currently working on the intersection of deep learning and uh, biodiversity monitoring. And I'm very happy to present on this uh, symposium today among all these great talks. So I'm going to talk about how we applied self-supervised learning for efficient biodiversity monitoring on a recent uh, chapter of ours. Um, so Healthy nature provides nature ecosystem services, limits our exposure to diseases, and mitigates extreme events and natural disasters. As you know, biodiversity is a, thus a key indicator of health and has in dramatic decline, having been impacted by human actions. Accurately monitoring biodiversity is key to evaluate the condition of our ecosystems, take action, and intercept that loss. So, collecting and the appropriate type and quantities of data is fundamental to overcome the problems of biodiversity monitoring and the challenges of it. So to that end, hardware developments and the affordability of automatic capture solutions make the data collection more accurate and efficient. Uh, in the animation here, you see a sequence of images collected in Kenya for our team in Biome Health, uh, which is a project that investigates biodiversity loss in relation to human activities. The project uses a grid of camera traps that collect images automatically on areas with varying levels of anthropogenic pressure. So these are placed strategically to um, correlate it at the later stage with the levels of pressure that is present on these areas. And tens of thousands of cameras though, like these are deployed globally by conservation projects and they produce a flow of information whose analysis demands a vast amount of experts time. And as you understand, these experts would ideally spend their time on something else and not on such a laborious task like image annotation. Supervised machine learning, which is used recently, exploits the availability of annotations in conjunction with the signal that's associated with each image and then establishes a function that, given an input image, can recognize a class. So for the species classification specifically, you can tell whether we have a zebra, a giraffe, or a gazelle. Um, of course, the progress made in deep neural networks boosted the performance of such approaches. Um, we're going to focus on species classification tasks, though, which comes with challenges, one of, one of which is the absence of labels. So we don't have um, labels for all the images we may need to have accuracy across uh, the variety of species that we have here. So. It, Acquiring these labels would, would be expensive and time consuming. And we, we, we acknowledge the fact that supervised learning has been a step towards efficient analysis, but um, there are extra challenges such as the fine grade categorization that is usually needed to be tackled, diversity of backgrounds, and the imbalance uh, that exists in these data, which means that a great amount of annotation will be needed to tackle this. Um, 
And a solution that has recently proven effective on, on unlabeled data sets is self-supervised learning. And self-supervised learning, given only the input images without labels, performs a pretext task uh, on a larger data set to learn a good representation of the data. And then this representation is used to initialize a model that will solve a downstream task such as object classification or detection. The benefit of, of such an approach is that it can exploit the signal that is inherent to the images themselves and establish connections without necessarily relying on the availability of a vast amount of annotation. Um, just to give an overview of such approach, like typically uh, it initially relies on data augmentations to get different views of the same image. So you see the same sort of image of the, on the left, but augmented in two different ways. And these augmentations can include color distortion, cropping, clipping, etc. Then these transform images are passed through feature encoders and lead to lower dimensional embeddings, which constitute a positive pair for, for the image and its augmented view, respectively. And then in the end, there is an unsupervised loss. There are no labels included, which maximizes the agreement between the two representations. So the assumption is that by forcing similarity between these views of the same image, the feature extractor learns to be invariant against the transformations and focus on the sem semantics that um, are stable between these two transformations. In our work, we're going to explore methods such as SimCLR and triplet loss that are recent, uh, like let's say, self-supervised learning methods that use negatives. But on this on this plot here, we um, we leave negatives out of the of the diagram for simplicity. Um, nevertheless, like uh, images collected from sensors in the wild, such as camera traps that we use here on this study, have variation that may not be captured by self-supervised learning and its augmentations. So there is natural variation though, and we need to find ways to capture it, like simply augmenting the image with flipping, cropping, and coloring. It's not enough to, to bridge these gaps that exist between these different elephants, for example. So we conducted an experiment initially to quantify the gap between standard self-provised technique and an Oracle version where we assume all the labels are known. So the positive selection can be optimal. And we found that there is a big gap between the standard approaches and an Oracle version where let's say we know the labels. Uh, so the gap, the gap persists even when a large percentage of mistaken positives is sampled. So we focus our efforts on selecting more effective positives rather than getting these augmentations that I described before. And to do that, like, as you know, we have contextual information that comes readily available with these image collections, such as um, when or when each image is captured. Um, we propose the incorporation of such contextual information to the self-supervised positive selection mechanism by sampling positive analogously to the contextual similarity, for example, Images that are close in space and time will have a higher probability to be selected as pairs. For example, in, in service in camera trap service, there can be camera images captured on the same camera within a few seconds, and they will have high contextual similarity. That may allow us to capture different variation of the same elephant, for example, that will turn its body. So we evaluate our approach, and to evaluate the quality of the representations learned, we use the linear classifier. Uh, trained on top of this unsupervised representation learning stage I described before, which is quite common for such techniques. Um, so initially we saw results from um, Masai Mara camera traps, and we compared our approach for standard techniques that are used on such datasets, such as transfer learning from a bigger dataset, such as ImageNet, and other self-supervised learning baselines that have been published before. So we observe that self-provised representations are more effective for classification in uncurated wildlife datasets when compared to widely adopted transfer learning baselines. So the takeaway from here is that it's good to exploit the, the dataset as a whole, even though labels may not be available for the whole dataset. Um, and in our suggestion, we where we exploit context, we have we gain a big boost to the standard approach. So that helps further bridge the gap with um, completely supervised approaches that depend on more annotations. For reference, we also show the fully supervised approach here, which we also outperform in the low data regime. One and 10% here, for example, is when we uh, have less data. So starting with the full data set, 10% means that we only have 10% of the data and 1% of the data here, respecting the, the balances, the class imbalances that, persist, that exist. So 
our, our findings were consistent across three different self-supervised techniques and four camera trap data discovering um, a variety of ecosystems. And surprisingly, we observed that the positive selection has more impact than the choice of the self-supervised method itself. So for qualitative evaluation of our approach, we also plot the five nearest neighbor images retrieved by the representations of unseen test images. And that, that means that applying each, each of these approaches to, um, let's say, an image of a bobcat, we, we retrieve without having labels, which images are more close to that. And we can see that um, comparing our context positive approach with standard self-provised learning, we observe that we can bring closer more diverse images of the same species without having human supervision at all. So the body posture of the bobcat here is more diverse than the one above. Um, and we approach the diversity of the Oracle baseline, which is still um, a long way to go. Uh, for more qualitative or quantitative results, we you can find them in, in our paper, which is recently published on ICV, like a computer vision conference. And this also includes some technical uh, details that you may be interested in. Code, our code is also available, by the way. So yeah, thanks for, for listening to me. Hopefully you listen to me and the sound is not so low. Thank you. Yes, the sound worked out well in the end. Thank you. Okay. Um, any questions for Miros? I actually had a question. I mean, yeah. we, we often hear about the problems of fire. Okay, <laughs> we often hear about the problems of bias in, in AI systems for humans, but what are the, I mean, for instance, uh, you could have a bias towards recognizing uh, male elephants more than female elephants, and and the other conclusions might be uh, wrong because of that. Have you looked into anything like that? Um, is that a potential danger? We definitely didn't uh, zoom in the individual difference within, uh, let's say, male and female. We, however, we we observed the ability to capture um, species correctly, even when these species are underrepresented. So, in the supplemental material of our work, we also show that uh, uh, using such techniques, like self-supervised techniques, we also gain. Um, performance on underrepresented species, which is like kind of wanted here, but not 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 in in the detail of having males versus females. I, I I do see a, I mean, if it's easy to identify male and females, it gives you a possibility to look at management options where, uh, because of hunting, for instance, males are being shot more than than females are being, and, and that's the same true in deer populations as well, because they, only the males have antlers in general. So it, it's quite an advantage if you can distinguish between the two in actual fact, but also the bias is potential disadvantage. Uh, I, I know that there are teams like, uh, that's that's great if it works out. I heard the, um, that there are teams working on um, identifying individual elephants in the first place. So. Um, on a more fine grain level, not 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 having male versus female, but having the specific elephant where it arrived and what track they followed. So that in combination on whether that's a female or male, that would be great. And I guess maybe a human in the loop saying whether the one that we track is female or male would be ideal. So definitely, definitely a great direction to continue. Thanks. Thanks, Miros. Um, that brings us to time. So I think that's our next speaker. And last but certainly not least is Ben Scott. Hi. Just share my screen. Can you see that, everyone? Yeah, it looks good. Brilliant, thank you. Um, hi, uh, my name is Ben Scott, and I'm the uh, tech lead at the NHM, the Natural History Museum Informatics Group. Um, so today I'll be talking about how we're using machine learning at the Natural History Museum, uh, particularly the specimen data refinery, but also some of our other um, cutting edge uh, projects. 
So the specimen data refinery is being built to allow us and other institutions to scale up our digitization work. Um, I'm sure you're familiar with the problem. Um, at the museum, at the Natural History Museum, we have 80 million specimens and we need to get these digitized and make them available. So um, they're available to research around the world, but it's a slow, laborious process. Um, to transcribe the, uh, the, the labels of the specimens takes time, but we can speed this up by replacing uh, the human in the loop with machine learning to actually extract the data from the labels. Um, but it's a, uh, it's a complicated process, um, like specimens come in different shapes and sizes, so there's no one, there's not one size model that fits all. Um, so for us, out of that 80 million specimens, we have 25 million pinned insects, 3, 3 million herbarium sheets, sheets <laughs> uh, 2.5 million microscope slides, um, and each, each one needs its own bespoke model for extracting the data. Um, the specimen data refinery is um, aims to, to fix this problem by, um, by, by changing the way models work slightly in that you construct a workflow um, and chain together multiple models. So each model can target one, one part of the data extraction process. Um, it's built with um, Galaxy, which is used in many different sort of scientific uh, workflow processes and uses a drag and drop interface so you can construct the workflows uh, that you need using the tools that, that, that can extract um, data for a particular, particular model. Um, so this is like a, a basic example. You feed an image in, that image uses um, is then semantically segmented to identify the, uh, the specimen and the labels. Uh, those labels are then OCR to, uh, to read the text. Um, and then we use natural language processing to identify the entities on the label, so the uh, the collector um, and the uh, the location and the taxa. Um, that was quite a, a simple example, but in reality, you can build um, incredibly complex workflows. Um, so any any uh, machine learning model used to um, to uh, extract data from a specimen label could potentially be joined into the um, the SDI as an additional tool. Um, so. We're um, prototyping it at the moment, but we will have tools to perform um, color analysis, um, like uh, handwritten re recognition, um, uh, tools to extract specimen trait data, like wing length or body length, um, simple color analysis of specimens, which can then be used as a feature for uh, uh, further down the pipeline for um, taxonomic identification or even just um, specimen quality analysis so discoloration um, denoting any physical damage that's happened within the collection and these are all quite simple to do because um, the, the models for doing each of these tools each of these tasks often exist and are published and we just we can just reuse them within the um, within the SDR so at its core, the, um, the, the, the SDR uses the uh, concept of an open digital specimen object, uh, which is um, a kind of a, sur a digital surrogate of the actual specimen. Um, and it can encapsulate all of the information about the physical specimen, the where it was collected, um, uh, who by, um, when it was collected. And so it can record all of the information uh, uh, that's uh, populated against the specimen object as it flows through the workflow. So every, every tool in the workflow receives a um, open digital specimen object as the input modifies that object and then returns that digital specimen object as the output. So every input output is validated against the, uh, the new data standards. So we know the data is correct. It also makes it easier to, uh, to create a tool uh, to add into the SDR data flow because every single tool will have the same input output. Um, it just plucks a different value for within that JSON schema. And also um, within Galaxy, every single data change made against that open um, digital specimen object is tracked. And so every, every change made to the, uh, to the digitization specimen object is reproducible. Okay. so. The tools within the SDR are, are very, are very simple uh, machine learning tools because um, 
or not not simple but atomic each one has a very very clearly defined task but however alongside this we have a number of um uh innovative uh, machine learning uh, projects which are attempting to um improve the accuracy of these uh, machine learning um, machine learning models and um, one of these is um using graph based machine learning it's being run by uh, uh, the postdoc in the uh, the museum informatics lab um so it's uh, using um data from gbif to build a um a graph based network which can then be used as a feature in the machine learning models for extracting data from specimen labels um so the logic is if we know a collector um, is operating within a certain like x number of years um, and collecting in certain areas of work of the world that can then help inform the um, the natural language processing of extracting the uh, the data from the text um, and there's there's many other uh, qualities of the specimen object photo and labels that can be used as features in this um, in this graph based modeling um, so uh, another example is like if the text is handwritten or from a typewriter or computer printed, that can help inform the age the specimen was collected or at least added to the collection. Um, so essentially what our postdoc is trying to do is um, encode some of the knowledge that our digitizer team has when they're uh, when they're looking at a specimen because they will be able to like take a look at a specimen and and be able to guess roughly, the, the year it was collected by just looking at the quality of the of the labels and the way they are printed and it's encoding those features as vectors to put into the computer model that our, our postdoc is examining. Um, another one of our, our, our projects is um, automated uh, trait extraction from literature. So we're training machine learning models to extract uh, functional trait data from taxonomic descriptions in um, historical publications. Uh, so this is working with the uh, the University of Glasgow and the uh, Biomathematics Institute of Scotland, and these um, these functional traits are then being used to to construct a digital twin of of, of uh, UK plant species. And this di digital twin will be able to model how well suited a plant is to their environment and how well it can be uh, adapt to climate change. Um, the the climate change modelling is being performed at Glasgow, but here we see how like machine learning and uh, working with the collections can directly help some of the answers that are, are pressing issues uh, facing humanity now. Now, how do, we, how do we respond and how can we deal with the uh, climate emergency we're facing? Uh, the next stage in that project is um, extracting trait data from herbarium sheets, um, because it, it's hard to find uh, the uh, textual description of traits that we need to feed into this model. But on um, herbarium sheets, we have uh, the dried um, and pressed uh, um, images of the plants. And so we can use computer vision to extract these same traits um, and then cross validate the, uh, the trait data we're pulling from text and literature with the, uh, the ones that we're pulling from the, um, the images as well. And again, all of this feeding into the, uh, the uh, computer simulation modeling the uh, UK biosphere. Um, the, the last project I want to talk about um, is uh, Voyager AI, um, and this is using machine learning in the collection, but coming, coming at it to, from a slightly different direction. Um, so we're using machine learning to improve the collection data and try and find lost specimens. So um, many of the uh, historical um, many of the uh, historical specimens in our collection are missing our provenance information mm -hmm. because it just wasn't considered that important for to have the exact location of a specimen and there were no sort of um, geospatial systems when these these specimens were collected over the hundreds of years but we do have um, the ship's logs which record the exact date time latitude and longitude of the ships that these specimens were collecting on so if we take the uh, ship's logs data for some of our most his most historic voyages like uh, Charles Darwin's Beagle or the Challenger expeditions, we can then run it against the specimens in our collections and in GBIF, and we can find the exact point and date these specimens were collected along the routes of these voyages. Um, and for many of these, the voyages of the collect 
or, or the collector were not recorded with the specimen. Uh, the beagle was only famous many years after Darwin's voyage on it, after he would, he'd uh, published his, um, his theories. So we're using machine learning to find the, um, the lost specimens in, collect in our collection that have lost their, uh, their sort of famous, most, most notable collectors. And I think that's what's um, so exciting about our uh, machine learning at the moment. Um, there's so many tech, tech companies like Google and Amazon um, innovating and releasing, and other institutions um, around the world, innovating with machine learning models. Um, and we're sitting at the museum and, and many museums around, um, around the world on a huge treasure trove of information and data. And we're in a wonderful position where we can join up that cutting, cutting, work, cutting edge work with the machine, machine learning and modeling with the huge, huge amounts of data that we possess. I'm um, getting that data, the specimen data into digital form and scaling up our digita digitization is just the start of the possibilities of what we can do with it. Um, so it can directly help tackle climate emergency. It can find specimens of important historical significance. And it's in such a fast paced area. Um, it's who knows what we'll be talking about in, uh, in years to come. Uh, a few acknowledgements because um, the SDR is a synthesis under funded project and part of DISCO and so it's a multi-partner endeavour and so we have lots of lo lots of partners um, helping us develop the models and the workflows to, uh, to get it to work and a, a few links to um, if you're interested in finding out more about the SDR. Thank you. Thanks so much Ben. We have a couple of questions for you over in Huba. I'll start sure. with one from um, you are at Poland. Galaxy is a widely adopted and powerful data processing workbench. How can I best publish and cite a Galaxy workflow and related input output data? Uh, well, our Galaxy workflows have um, our built in DOIs um, and we're going to attach DOIs to the specimens as well. Um, how to actually cite the workflow itself? We haven't worked on that yet, but it's just the um, the prototype we're building at the moment. So um, yeah, I'm sure we'll um, we'll have a have a solution to that problem, so you can cite the exact workflow that you use to uh, to uh, process your uh, specimen image. And this one from Lauren Gillespie. Do you have a preprint or publication that outlines the machine learning methods you use for trade extraction from text? Uh, I do not yet, but I'm writing that up at the moment. Uh, we've got a, uh, we just finished our first grant on that and we're just uh, applying for our second one. So yeah, we'll be writing that up in the next few months. Perfect. So yeah, I will share it online. <laughs> Great, thank you. Um, and let's see, I think that's all that's in there so far. Um, please feel free to add another question for Ben over in Whova if anybody has one before we jump into um, some more open discussion time. I just have a quick question, which could just be a browser issue on my side, but I was just trying to navigate to that Voyager, um, the, um, how I wrote it down is Voyager slash dbif.netify.app and um, trying to get that to work. Is that a um, uh, something that I should be able to reach just from my browser there? Uh, yes, it, it is. It worked for me. <laughs> yeah, it was working <laughs> yesterday when I put it in. I would check. Right. Yeah, I'll, uh, I'll have to keep working on my end then, but that looks really exciting. Thanks for sharing that. Thank you. But, but I did wonder how you link between that and the actual specimens. I mean, the, the app shows you the direction of the voyages and things, but where can you get the actual data? Ah, uh, that's on um, GitHub. I think uh, it's linked in the, uh, the, uh, the 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 sort of information window there. Yeah, okay. that's a, a link just to sort of a pretty um, picture of it. <laughs> uh, but the data is there if you uh, click through on the links. Super. Thanks, Ben. So if I'm not mistaken, we have 15 minutes now for open discussion. Is that right, Quentin? Uh, yes, I think so. If people have things they want to discuss. Yeah, and there are a couple of questions in Whova. So maybe I'll get us rolling with those. Um, Steve Baskoff um, says this is a question for all presenters at the end. So perfect, Steve, thank you for providing that. Um, and it is, Audubon Core recently adopted standard terms for describing regions of interest, ROIs, in images. However, these terms are currently limited to rectangles and circles. 
So one, how hard would it be to standardize the description of segmented parts of images? And two, would having such a standard be useful? So if anybody, um, speakers or otherwise, I noticed there's a really rich discussion happening in the chat as well. So um, speakers, if you'd like to have a, have a shot at answering that, please do. Um, and I'll, I'll also open it to a uh, full group discussion. Um, I can answer that from the uh, specimen yeah. data refinery uh, because um, obviously having a um, Having a having a standard for describing the uh, ROIs of the uh, of the image is a huge part of that because we need a way to be able to pass the ROIs between each um, atomic task in the in the workflow. Um, we haven't adopted the Audubon Audubon standard. Um, we're using the um, I, I think it's based off the uh, IIIF um, uh, way of describing ROIs. But um, it's yeah, if if there was a standard, it'd be incredibly useful. Yeah, and something we would definitely adopt for the SDR. Yeah, can I just follow up with, uh, audio with that? So like the use case that, that we had been thinking about is like, say a picture that has 10 fish in it and somebody wants to refer to a particular fish and say, you know, this photo of this fish is a basis for some occurrence. But, um, you know, the other use case would be something like, well, this part of the image is a leaf. And so if you want to analyze this leaf later for some trait analysis or something, you don't have to go through the whole uh, process of identifying it and segmenting it. But then I was noticing, Ben, in your um, workflow, one of the things that you were doing is like making those morphological measurements. So maybe there's no purpose if the data has already been extracted to sharing that sort of information with other people. um yeah well i think it's um it would still be useful to to share even if it's um if even if it's like our process further down the pipeline in the workflow um it's just um because if it's um we if it's it can then be used as a training data set by other people i think the the more the data that comes out of the sdr in a in a usable format um yeah the better so is there a standardized way of like um, expressing the outlines of the segments, like as opposed to just the rectangles, which would be easy? Um, in the SDR, no, no, that's not. I, um, but yeah, we, we're not using the Audubon uh, core definition. Uh, ben, why don't you um, stop sharing your screen and maybe the <laughs> other course. speak? Maybe the other speakers want, want to put their cameras on and uh, because I think some of those questions are, are good for the other speakers too. Sorry, yeah, stop sharing. I didn't know whether anyone else wanted to answer that same, answer that same question about, uh, about uh, ways to store um, segments. I see something in the chat, that's why I'm wondering. Yeah, just to clarify, we don't have that. We we don't we only have circles and rectangles. We don't have a way to express segments. So the question is like, is there a way to do it? And would it would that particular method of describing a region of interest be helpful? Yeah, I can see Matt Yoda suggesting using SVG. Uh, also, Matthias is. Okay, I, I think there's another long thread in the, the chat um, that Yorit is bringing up is the way to cite image corpses. And I know I've talked to Yorit about this before, and I, I wonder if uh, maybe Yorit can, is, can he unmute so he can explain what he wants to say, and then maybe we can get some responses off the speakers. Uh, sure, can you hear me okay? Yep. Yep, yeah, so um, I'm, I'm, I'm really excited that now more and more people are starting to use these images that have uh, have been uh, have resulted from hundreds and hundreds of millions of dollars of investments in digitizing these um, collections. So that's really exciting. And what I'm sort of wondering is like, how do you cite a collection of images in a in a scientific paper? Because we know collections change, 
you know, things go up and down and all that stuff. And one of the key things that is uh, important, I think, to AI research or yeah, whatever that means um, is to define exactly what the input was so that you can uh, tweak the algorithms and see how the output changes, right? And I've been asking the same question pretty much, you know, uh, in this session, basically asking, how do you cite and reproduce the input? So that's that's really a sort of an active interest of mine. And, you know, there, there are many ways to do it. And I'm just curious to see and hear about others that have reliably cited huge image corpuses uh, in, a, in a pragmatic way. Gwen, you're muted. Yeah, sorry. Uh, I was wondering, uh, Lauren, how does that work with satellite images? Um, when you when you produce a model based on satellite images, how do you cite a particular image? Because it's a, it's another community that we don't necessarily always deal with. Uh, so usually you just cite the program from which the imagery was uh, collected. So some papers will collect their own imagery. So they'll have either drones or UAVs that they will um, do flights over a specific area. And those tend to be smaller um, data sets. And then um, there are larger, oftentimes government run programs. So NAIP is through the US farm, uh, USDA farm uh, agency. And then there's also, of course, MODIS, which is through, um, I believe, NOAA. And then, of course, NASA, JPL has a ton of satellites up that get various remote sensing products. Um, that includes um, the Landsat class of uh, imagery. And so usually you just cite the mission uh, if it's a specific satellite that produces a wide, uh, like global imagery, or if it's a data set that was curated for a specific paper, we typically cite that paper. Now there are some data sets such as the GeoLife Life data set, which uses other data sets to build a more specific data set. And so typically you cite the data set instead of the actual image sources because the original paper that built the data set should have done that. Okay, so you're not really citing a specific image very often, no. I think yeah. um, repositories like GBIF, they are providing uh, DOI numbers, document object identifying numbers. Whenever you download, you access a data set and uh, you need to cite it then they provide you with a DOI number. So you are using this and uh, whenever someone needs to, wants to work with the same data set and they can just go to that DOI and download the same data set. So it's, it's been well documented that there's no uh, unique, unique sort of reliable relationship between a DOI and the data set that they uh, reference. So uh, I think that's, might be a start, but there, as far as I know, there is no clear relationship between the DOI and the images that may or may not have been uh, related to, to that DOI at the time that DOI was. Uh, yeah, I guess it depends if the DOI refers to specifically to a image or whether it's just part of a larger data set that's updated every now and then. Even if it refers to a specific image, uh, it's still not, there's no clear uh, verifiable relationship between a DOI and an image, bits and bytes. Right. I think repositories are producing DOIs for uh, the data sets, not the images themselves. Like we need something like, uh, DOI number for a subset of data that we have created. So we are missing that. I do think that GBIF creates a specific DOI for a specific um, subset of their data. So like when you go through and click through the different filters that you want, and then you generate the K observations that you're 
going to use for your new data set, then they'll, it'll assign a DOI for that subset of data because they essentially have like an XML or a JSON that, sorry, that um, describes what the data that it's um, subset it down to and then that gets assigned the DOI. Again, they do Actually. definitely yeah, as well. I noticed a, a question in the in Whova that I'll just I'll put out there in case folks uh, speakers want to respond to it. Um, Abby Benson says, curious about the opportunity for learning from the annotation work that takes place for marine images, like imaging flow cytobot or autonomous underwater vehicles. Have the presenters examined what is happening in the marine realm? Sounds like maybe not so much yet. <laughs> that sounds like a, an untapped um, and very large um, area of research that, that can be explored there. Or, or anybody else in the audience have experience with that? Oh, there's a great new world to get into. <laughs> no kidding. Oh, oh, yeah. Sorry, Abby, oh, no, I was going to ask Abby, can you repeat that question, Abby? Marine sets? Marine images? Yeah, Abby, if you're there and able to unmute and want to um, speak a little more to your question. Otherwise, I could just reread it from Luva, but maybe you can provide a little more context. Sure. Yeah. Can you guys hear me okay? I don't have my headset on. Yep. Yeah, that's great. Um, yeah. So the question is really, you know, there's a lot of work happening in the re marine realm on um, processing images and annotating them because it's it's very difficult to observe marine life. So you send out autonomous underwater vehicles to take images of the sea floor of um, uh, species that are down there or imaging flow cytobot uh, takes images of little uh, plankton. So the tiny little creatures that live in the ocean and um, uses machine learning to identify those species. So I'm just there wasn't really any marine component to this session. So I was just wondering if people in the terrestrial realm are looking at what's happening in the re marine realm because they think they're you know, pretty far along in what they're doing in annotation work. Thanks, Abby. I, I see Patricia, you have your hand raised. You wanna go ahead and unmute? Yeah, um, I hope my voice is okay because sometimes my microphone is off. Um, oh, good, yeah. Okay. Uh, well, I just know that uh, marine centers like the, the Flemish Institute for the Sea, they go routinely take samples and then they have make images of the marine macroinvertebrates and they can identify them to the order or sometimes the genus, they don't go down the species level. And then they make images for uh, bio-monitoring. And so uh, based on the, the Taxa, they identify automatically by image recognition. They can follow the quality of the changes. So the, the place where they go sampling, for example, where they do the wind farms and things like that. So when I visited them, they, they showed us that. But uh, I don't know if they use machine learning on, on robots or automated uh, machines that uh, take images uh, in the sea that uh, they didn't show it. But I can imagine that this is done here. Thanks, Patricia. Um, yes, and I see your hand up as well. Uh, we, we are working on uh, fish specimens, which are like what marine organisms, uh, nothing else. Uh, but there are other project people that we are working together. Uh, they are working on uh, either individual uh, uh, specimens, like living specimens in the nature, or uh, photographs of those uh, specimens. So it is possible if you are working uh, with a very small uh, group of taxa, otherwise you can like generalize uh, which, what kind of uh, object is that. It, it is, if it, it, if it is a, a fish or like a mollusk or something. So the, uh, area is too big, like there are a lot of things in motion, so. Thank you, that sounds like a, 
a, a lot of opportunity there for, for new research and exploration. Thank you. Uh, I notice we're at the top of the hour here. So um, I'm going to point us to Huva, and uh, I believe, and maybe one of the organizers could um, confirm or, or deny this, that the Huva chat and questions will live there for a little while if discussions want to continue in that space. Um, we can point folks there, is that right? Yeah, absolutely. They will be there um, pretty much indefinitely for as long as this um, app is up. But yeah, you can go in and check those questions in the chat and the community board. Those will all be up for quite some time. Great, thank you. Um, yeah, absolutely. Um, so I'll, I'll just say a couple words and pass it to Quentin. Thank you all, everybody, for um, coming and hearing these great speakers. Thank you to the speakers for your amazing research and sharing it with us today. Thank you, Quentin, for organizing this um, and um, to the um, conference organizers in the UF folks who are um, providing so much support. Um, Quentin, final words. No, I think you've said it all. Thank you uh, very much all the speakers. Uh, it's been really very interesting and I uh, hope we can keep some of this discussion going during the week as well. Thank you.